Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. If you are in your car and listening on your radio, give me a little toot on the horn. Looks like it's working. We've been doing this every week for over two months. And on behalf of the family, we are so honored at your presence. The family has rightly requested that today be a celebration. And it already looks like a celebration. Not a morning of death, but a celebration of life. And what Miss Lou wanted will be honored today. And so we will do right now something that would usually seem inappropriate at a funeral. If you loved Miss Lou, let it be known loud and clear with your horns right now. Amen. Family, I know that you are honored and blessed by this showing here. It speaks more than words ever could. And now a special song, and then some more special music, all in honor of a very special lady. I'm kind of homesick for a country to which I've never been. Before no sad goodbyes will there be spoken, for time won't matter anymore. Beulah land, I'm longing for. Good morning. Lucille Hall Hamilton, 83, of New London, Ohio, went home to be with the Lord on June 5, 2020, at home surrounded by her family after a lengthy illness. She was born on November 21, 1936, in Honaker, Kentucky. 
to the late James David and Maggie Scaff Hall. She grew up in Floyd County, Kentucky, and graduated from Betsy Lane High School in 1954. On June 2nd, 1956, she married the love of her life, J.D. Hamilton. Of Together they moved to New London in 1957. She was a member of the First Baptist Church in New London since 1974. She worked at the Inn, Bob Martin's Village Restaurant, and the Fitchville Restaurant. She was a beloved wife, mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother. She took pride in taking care of her family. Lucille had a green thumb and loved to work in her flower beds and vegetable garden where she enjoyed canning everything that she grew. She was also a great cook and always made enough to share. She is survived by a loving husband of 63 years, J.D. Hamilton, daughters Kathy and Dennis Carpenter, Rhonda and Brian Ziegler, Pamela Pooter, son Frederick Deborah Hamilton, grandchildren Dennis and Jessica Carpenter, Jennifer and Grover Hale, Corey Pooter, Kyle Pooter, Sandra Colt, Sandra and Colt Cook, Jessica and Josh Hinder Hamilton, and Jeremiah and Elizabeth Hamilton, along with 11 great-grandchildren, Vera and Genevieve Pooter, Chase and Chloe Cook, Brooklyn Baker, Bishop and Liam Kindler, Abigail Holland, William and Bella Hamilton, and Melva Isaiah Pooter. She is also survived by her brothers Tommy, Nell Hall, and Delmar, Ray, and Lula Hall, and many nieces and nephews. She is preceded in death by her parents, sisters Bessie Owens and Linda Sue Hall, brothers Alaska, Henry, Charles, James, and Frank Hall. The family would like to send a special thank you to the staff of the Laurels of New London and Hospice of North Central Ohio as well as Patience Columbus for the excellent care they provided. In lieu of flowers, memorial donations may be directed to the First Baptist Church of New London, Ohio, or to the Breast Cancer Foundation in honor of Lucille Hall Hamilton. Online condolences may be shared with the family at www.eastmanfuneralhome.com. Thank you. This is a special occasion, of course. My father and mother came to this area back in 1963, and I was with them then. We met the Hamiltons and have known the family for many, many years, J.D. and the rest of many of you. And we're so grateful for that. Uh, my name is Randy Merrill. My father was a pastor down at Bethel Baptist, Ron Merrill, for many years. So this is a very special occasion that we could be in the area and they've asked us to share and we wanted to share a song that talks about Lou's life because she believed that Christ would lead her every step of the journey and we know that that is true. Even the lady who wrote this song, Fanny Crosby, her blind eyes penned those words, all the way my Savior leads me.
every step of the journey, and uh, we have enjoyed walking some of those steps together. Sometimes, though, it gets pretty dark, doesn't it? Sometimes it gets pretty bleak, and you wonder, wow, am I going to make it through this? But it's kind of like when you go down the hall, and you wonder when it's dark at night if there's any light, but if you look under the threshold and see under the door, you can see the lights on in the other room. And for the last few days and weeks and even months, it's looked kind of dark, but the threshold, you can see under it, there's light at the end of the tunnel. There's light at the end of the tunnel.
minister to our hearts as we've already been in church today just by hearing these songs. The Merrills are with us the next couple of Sundays inside and BBS this Sunday through Thursday. Family, I want you to turn around and take a look at all that's around you. If you can stand, do that. And folks, let's just let this family know how we feel about them at this time. With our horns right now, let them know how you feel about them. <laughs> a lot of love and then a little more love. <laughs> in 2 Corinthians in chapter 12, the Apostle Paul was telling the Lord his complaint, his struggle in life. And the Lord did not remove his complaint, but said these words in verse 9, My grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. There's a good old gospel song that said, His grace is sufficient for me, and his love is abundant and free, and what joy fills my soul just to know, just to know that his grace is sufficient for me. God is the only one who can help in times of great grief and heartache. And family, he will comfort you if you will allow him. He understands. Most of us have seen on grandma's wall or on our own wall a, a painting with a poem called Footprints in the Sand. Where a man had a dream that he was walking along the beach and during uh, the course of his life he saw footprints his and the Lord's, all along the beach. But when he got to heaven, he asked the Lord, why was it that during some of the lowest and saddest times of my life, there was no longer two sets of footprints, there was only one. How in the lowest times of my life could you lead me? And the Lord said, my son, my precious child, I would never leave you. I love you. In those low and dark times of your life where you see only one set of footprints, it was then that I was carrying you. What a beautiful picture of sustaining grace. The Bible teaches that God gives sustaining grace to those who need it. Now let's back up a little bit and talk about the grace of God. It begins with saving grace. Saving grace. John Newton was a drunken slave trader and not living his life right at all, but after coming to Christ as his Savior, he wrote the words, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. He was writing about saving grace, and we've all sung the word so many times. And I hope you're a born-again Christian who has experienced saving grace. And then, if you have, there is to you, and only to you who have experienced saving grace, another grace available, not to the lost, but to the children of God, and that is this sustaining grace. It is the grace that holds you up during times of trial and sorrow and loss and grief and despair and temptation and stress and pressure in this life. It's the grace that keeps you going when you don't know if you can keep going. It's sustaining grace. And so it was another songwriter who wrote the words, He giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. 
he sendeth more strength when the labors increase. To added afflictions, he adds his mercy. You got multiplied trials? He multiplies his peace. Why? Because his love has no limit. His grace has no measure. His power has no boundary known unto man. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth grace and giveth grace and giveth grace again. Here's a wonderful truth to you, family and gathered friends. The wonderful thing about God's grace available to those who've been born again, those who've accepted saving grace, the wonderful thing about God's sustaining grace is this. The more you need, the more you get. God's sustaining grace. What sustaining grace is not, it's not the absence of normal emotions. Rather, it helps us to work through our normal emotions. It's not the absence of sorrow and tears. I've even heard a preacher say Christians should be so full of joy that they just walk into the funeral home laughing and rejoicing. Now that's nonsense. We are humans. We have grief. We are suffering pain and loss. Tears and sorrow and grief are a gift from God that help us to relieve built up tension and emotion. They show how much we feel. Tears Reveal how much we care and how deeply that we love. <clears throat> and if it's true what they say, that a picture is worth a thousand words, then I think it's also true that tears speak a million words that we can't get out. For tears are a language that God understands. Well, in Revelation 21, the Bible says, there's coming a day when God shall wipe away all tears from our eyes. But until then, it's okay to cry, it's okay to grieve, to groan. And sustaining grace is not the absence of these normal emotions. It's not the absence of anger. Uh, it's not the absence of guilt, wishing that we had done something differently with our time with the person we're now missing. It's not the absence of pressure, the normal pressures of life, personal matters, financial matters, endless paperwork the family goes through now. Sustaining grace is not the absence of any of these things, but our text today says his grace is sufficient. I want you to consider three brief things from the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter, uh, in Matthew uh, Verse number 28 says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Zero in on these words. Come unto me, all ye, and I will give you rest. Three quick things to take with you today. The first is the proposition where Jesus says to all of us, Come unto me. You know, there's plenty of places you can go and not find sustaining grace. But Jesus is where you will find sustaining grace. And he's the one who says, come unto me with all of your needs. Come unto me. This is the proposition. Oh, there's lots of places you can go and not find sustaining grace. Many in our world today look to science rather than to the truth of the Bible. But science cannot offer anyone sustaining grace. Some turn to philosophy or logic or reason. Some turn to a bottle or a pill or a syringe or a powder. But they can't in those locations find sustaining grace. Only Jesus is the rock in a weary land. Only Jesus is the shepherd of the flock. Only Jesus is the water of life to a thirsty soul, the bread of life to the hungry soul. Only Jesus is the burden bearer for the heavy laden. And only Jesus can satisfy your soul. Only Jesus can give sustaining grace. Why only Jesus? 
Because only Jesus left heaven's glory to come live the perfect life we could not live. Only Jesus then died the vicarious death that we deserved to pay for our sins. Only Jesus claimed to be God and then proved it by conquering death, rising again on the third day. Can I have an amen from the horns present here today? Only Jesus. Only Jesus. And if that isn't love, then the ocean is dry. There's no stars in the sky, and the sparrow can't fly if that isn't love. Only Jesus. Well, many churches today, you'll notice, are trying to take Jesus to the world. And that sounds good at first, except some mean dropping Jesus down to a level that the world will consider tolerable. In other words, since you won't come to Jesus, we'll bring him down to you. Listen, Jesus said, come unto me. That is the proposition. Come unto me for saving grace. Come unto me for sustaining grace. He is the source. That's the proposition. Come unto me. Secondly, the persons, all ye. All ye. Who is he talking to? All ye. Who be ye? Oh, I'm happy to report, ye be me. Ye be thee. Ye be we. All ye. His grace is offered to any and all who will come to him. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how long you've done it. He wants to save you from your sin, and then he wants to sustain you through this life in this world and take you to another where you can see Lou again. His grace is offered to all who will come to him, the poor as well as the rich, educated, uneducated. He saved the thief on the cross just like he saved a religious man named Nicodemus. Think of all the invitations given in the Bible to come. He says, come unto me in our text. In Genesis, he told Noah to come into the ark, to come into the place of safety. In Isaiah 1, he said, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Come unto me, he said. An invitation to come to the place of of cleansing. In Matthew, Jesus invited us to come to the marriage, to sit at the table with him, the place of provision. And in Revelation 22, it says, the spirit and the bride say, come. He gives us an invitation today to come unto him. Come unto me, he says. Who? All ye. All ye. Whosoever will may come. Miss Lou wanted me to talk not just to her family today, but to all of her friends gathered here today, all who will listen later and make some things very clear. I don't know what you need sustaining grace for today, or if you need it today, but if you don't need it today, you will. You will be needing it at some point. There's as many needs on this gravel parking lot, as there are people, and all are invited to come. And so we see the proposition, come unto me, the persons, all ye. Number three, the promise, and I will give you rest. It's Jesus' red ink on white paper. It's a promise from him who cannot lie. I will give you rest. Now, family... Let me remind you of the time-old tradition from generations gone by of people seeing a ship off from the harbor. They gather there at the shore, and they have a friend who's on the boat. <clears throat> and they watch the boat launch out. And they watch the boat move away from them. And this family has been watching Miss Lou move away for some time. And you've stayed so close, you've not left the dock at any point because you wanted to see her as long as you could. And God granted you even 
some weeks beyond what the doctor said that you were going to have, and you were enthralled and you enjoyed every single moment, even as she became more and more distant. And basically you were doing the same thing that people have done for centuries with literal boats. As they watch it go over the horizon, they say these words, There she goes! And what a wonderful truth that every departure leads to an arrival. And though we are on one shore today, sorrow, sorrowing not for her, but for us who are left behind. While we are here on this shore today saying, there she goes. There's people on another shore. And Doc just read about many of their names that have gone on before saying, look, there she comes. Here she comes. Make sure your anchor is in the harbor of heaven. For just as every departure leads to an arrival, you want to make sure that your arrival is at the correct destination. And not just to see Miss Lou again. And not just to see others who have gone on before. But to see Jesus I didn't have the privilege that many of you had to know Miss Lou intimately. But I had a wonderful experience last Friday, just a couple hours before she departed, to hold her hand, and the Lord led me to pray as I was holding her hand, Lord, what a privilege it is to right now hold a hand that in a few moments will hold yours. I touched that skin that touched his skin, and so did all of you, and all of you. His grace is available. Sustaining grace, only to those who have experienced saving grace. I don't know how anybody attempts to go through this world without knowing Jesus Christ as their Savior. I wouldn't want to live particularly in this year of 2020 and all that's going on without knowing Jesus Christ personally? I could not make it without His sustaining grace made possible, first of all, by His saving grace. Last things Miss Lou wanted shared. Very simply, if you need to, get saved. If you need to, maybe you're saved but not living it. If you need to, get it right. If you need to, get into church. I'm sure there was many times she told you young people when you were, uh, when you kids, when you were annoying her as little kids, get, get. Three gets today. Get saved. Get right. Get into church. She's looking on. The Lord who saved her and will save you is looking on. Honor her not just this day. Honor her this Sunday. Honor her in the future. By getting saved, if you need to. Getting it right while there's still time. And getting into church. How many of you love the Lord? Let it be known by a an amen of your horn right now. You love the Lord. I always get a kick out of some people saying, I love Jesus, but I don't really love the church. Listen, when you love somebody, you love what they love. And Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Get saved, get right, get into church. This is the message. Come unto me, all ye. And I will give you rest. It's sustaining grace. Let's pray. Our Lord, today it is so wonderful to have the experience of knowing you. May we know you personally. May we know you more deeply, more intimately. May we be changed because of the life of this one. 
who set such an example faithful to you and to your church after she experienced saving grace here at First Baptist for 46 more years. Lord, this is a challenge that we have to follow in those footsteps. As the Apostle Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Help us to follow Lou all the way to heaven. Lord, I pray for souls gathered right now or listening right now to this recording that have never trusted you sincerely for salvation. I pray that they would just tell you in a prayer right now that they believe. That they would say, Lord, I believe. I believe that I'm a sinner on my way to hell, but that you are a Savior who wants to take me to heaven. I believe that my sins have to be paid for, that I don't want to pay for them in hell. I want to have them paid for the same way Lou's were paid for, by the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. I don't want to face life without it. I don't want to face death without it. So I accept your salvation, Lord. You who conquered death in my place will help me to conquer death and rise again to heaven one day. Help me live my life for you now to get it right, to be in church, and to follow your ways all my days. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. In just a moment, the Merrills are going to come back and not sing. They're going to play some music while we make our exit. And I believe that Eastman is going to help direct uh, our departure in an orderly fashion from here. And so just wait, enjoy the music, and follow instructions.